E equals V times E. Well, hello, um, Ethan and others. This is my first video to uh, try and catch you up with what's going on in classes. So we've had the class that you were in, and I introduced um, rearranging formulae, uh, and a reminder of that, and the class you weren't in, in which case we did indices, cosine rule, low resistance meter, what meter frequent clamp on, we didn't touch that, current voltage, energy and impedance, we did touch mass, weight, levers, and we didn't touch gears and pulleys. P equals V squared over R, make V the subject, we multiply both sides by R, we can get rid of this R, we can get rid of that one, making V the subject. What do we do on both sides that is the opposite of squaring? I asked the class what the opposite of squaring was, and they had difficulty answering. Likewise with um, taking the root of something, what the opposite of that was, they had difficulty in answering that too. The opposite of squaring, saying V times V, is square root. So we square root both sides, which gets rid of that little square, and we square root that side. And that is the rearranged. Make Z the subject of PF equals R over Z. Do we recognize what PF is? So ZPF equals R over Z. We've multiplied that by Z, and we've multiplied that by Z. This time you want to get rid of PF, get rid of that, divide it by P times F, which gets rid of all that. Design and there's your rearranged form. Now we know Z equals R squared plus X squared. So I did introduce this as the impedance triangle. Z is impedance here, R pure resistance is down here, and reactance, whether it be L or C here, inductive or capacitive reactance, the reactance part is up here. And remember I said that what we're interested in is the cosine of that angle, which gives us power factor. The cosine of that angle is got by dividing the small base, the base, by the longer side. The base, R, divided by the longer side, will always give you a number under one. This is going to be something like a power factor of 0.8 equals cosine theta. And that angle there we call the phase angle. The phase angle, or the phase shift of our uh, different power, our apparent power, our true power, and what type of power is that? Reactive power. This is in K bar, KVAR, reactive. This is in KVA, what we pay for. This is kilowatts, the true power. Apparent power, KVA, true power in kilowatts. So they're the same triangle with the same power factor, the same phase shift angle. This is kilowatts amps, KVA, apparent. This is what you pay for. It's more than what you can actually get in effort that is actually expended. Now this true power here, divided by this longer side, will give you a number under one. If you end up with a number that is over one, you have divided the wrong side by the wrong side. Okay? Because you divide the base by the hypotenuse, you will get the cosine of the angle in between. I just want to emphasize this, just without the um, Sokotoa thing, just because I want you to see the logic of it. This resistance here, divided by the total, the total opposition to current flow, so this is opposition to current flow caused by pure resistance. This is total opposition to current flow caused by a mixture of resistance and reactants, whatever reactants we have. If we divide the pure resistance by the total opposition to current flow, which is bigger, we get a number under one, which is the cosine of the phase shift between current and voltage. So back to our rearranging formulae. This thing here is nothing other than A squared equals B squared plus C squared which is Pythagoras' theorem. All they've done is they've square-rooted both sides, which gets rid of that little indi indi indicator there. We want to carry out the opposite of this square root on both sides so we can get rid of that square root. We want to get rid of that. So the opposite of square-rooting is squaring. Then we want to take away the x minus x squared 
plus z squared. We've taken that away. Now we've got r squared. If we square root both sides, we can get rid of that indicator there. Or that index, as we call it. Because they're indices. That index, we get rid of it, we have now carried out. Now, what we normally do is put z squared minus x squared, rather than minus x squared plus z squared, but it doesn't matter. That is the same. A bit of the reactant triangle. Remember, there's two types of reactants. There's L, which is inductive reactants, and there's C, which is the opposite, which is capacitive reactants. If we can pull this hypotenuse down and get it closer to unity here, we can reduce that phase shift angle by adding capacitance, because the capacitance triangle is opposite to the inductive triangle. What else can we see about this? So, what's this one? What's the hypotenuse to represent? Total resistance to current flow. And this one is pure resistance. Resistivity is the Greek letter rho. And that is the System International, the SI unit for resistance of a material. SI unit. And this is what we also covered in the last lesson. SI units, a recap of that. So resistivity, ohm meters. Okay? And what does that mean? That means a cube of copper one by one by one meter, a cube of copper. If we put an electrode on one end here, and an electrode on the other end here, and we measure the resistance of that cube of copper, that is our system international ohm meter of rho for that material. So if we've got Take a PVC twin and a single. There we go. A twin and a PVC single. There's another one here. And let's call that one millimetre. Shall we call that one millimetre cable? This is one millimetre. That's the cross-sectional area. One millimetre. What we need to do to our whatever number we've got, 1.62 times 10 to the 8, minus 8. We need to reduce it, because that is, we need to increase it, I mean increase the resistance. How many millimetres in a square metre? Yeah? How many, I asked. A couple of people came up with a million, 1 times 10 to the 6. So our resistance of this cable here, is going to be a million times more per metre than the resistivity of copper. Which means, take that 8 off and it will be to the minus 2. Or, 0.06 ohms per metre for 1 millimetre squared copper. Now I'm just going to go and look up what the actual resistivity of copper is. So you've got that figure in your head. The of copper is 1.724. 1. 0.724. So I was right the first time. 1.724 ohm meters. So that is for a cube of copper, one meter by one meter. Okay, now in, I think, your on site guide. There we go. This table here, GSA, and back in, through the CPC, different CSAs. Table India 1 in the on site guide. Talking about current lag, talking about current lag again, I current lag for 
an inductor, if the voltage is here, what's the current doing? The way to remember it is C, I, V, I, L. Civil. Right. For an inductor, L, the current lags the voltage. The current lags the voltage. So here's the current. Lagging the voltage. The voltage starts off, the current lags it. For a capacitor, the current capacitor, C, the current, I, leads the voltage. So the voltage lags. The current leads the voltage. So here's the voltage on the capacitor. The current will start flowing and the voltage will go up as the current reduces, the voltage will go down. But the current curve is moved to lead the voltage curve, and in this one, which I've done in red, then the current will lag the voltage. So therefore we can see that if we add capacitance to our inductive system, and most systems are inductive, we can pull the reactance hypotenuse this, with this reactance here, X, we can pull this down in size and that will move the hypotenuse down. So we will end up with a smaller phase angle and a higher cosine. Because as the cosine gets bigger, the angle reduces. Here's the cosine curve. And here's the angle naught. As we go up to the angle naught, the cosine reaches unity, one. As class three levers, I didn't start with class one, the seesaw. I started with class three, because where they normally say it's a bigger, I found a better one, and that is your elbow. So a class three lever is, there's your ulna, and that goes into your shoulder, here's the ulna, here's the radius, boom, and there's the hand, oh I've got six fingers, we've got five plus thumb, four plus the thumb, haven't we? Right, in a class three lever, the load is at the end of the lever, the fulcrum is at the other end of the lever, which is your elbow, and the effort is halfway along. What do you notice about this lever system? I notice that there is no mechanical advantage given by this lever system, i.e. if you put an effort in of 30 newtons, which is like just under, well, just over three kilograms worth of force, it would feel like. You're not going to lift three kilograms here, are you? With 30 newtons of force here. Because that is one, two, three, four. That's a fifth of the way along. And from the fulcrum, that's one fifth. And to the load, it's five fifths away. So. What I'm saying is that that is one-fifth, the effort, to five-fifths, the load. So the load is going to be five times smaller than the effort you're putting in. So that means it's going to be 0 0.6 kilograms if we take gravity as 10 instead of 9.81. 9.81 Newtons per kilogram, we're just saying 10. So we're saying 30 newtons should lift 3 kilograms if the load was here. But it's out here, so it's going to lift a fifth of the amount. 
So there is no mechanical advantage in this system. However, if we lift this by two inches, we lift at the, at the effort two inches, that will be magnified in a class three by the distance from the fulcrum five times. So this will go up 10 inches. So though there's no mechanical advantage, in fact, we do get a sort of gearing. We move the effort two inches on a class three, we move the load 10 inches in this instance. And it's all to do with the distance from the fulcrum there. So I've introduced a class 3 lever, and you've seen that in a class 3 lever, the fulcrum is at the one extremity, and the load is somewhere past the effort. The effort is between the fulcrum and the load. The effort is the muscle. Now, remember, class 1 class 2 lever. lever has the fulcrum, not the, not the effort, as in class 3, between the load and the fulcrum, Class one has the fulcrum between the load and the effort. And we measure from the fulcrum half a meter. We put 200 newtons as the load. Therefore, what is the effort to balance that at two meters? It's going to be a quarter, one, two, three, four half meters, and only one half meter, a quarter of the amount, 50 newtons. Yeah? So we can see it's a ratio. 0 0.5 times 200 will equal the same as 2 times 50. 2 meters times 50 newtons is the same as 0.5 meters times 200 newtons. Now a class 2 lever is known as a wheelbarrow. Class 3 has the effort between the fulcrum and the load. Class 1 has the fulcrum between the load and the effort. Class 2 has the effort or the load correction between the fulcrum and the effort. Effort, fulcrum, load. No. And we measure two meters times a hundred newtons is the same as four meters times fifty newtons. So 2 times 100 newtons, 200 newtons pulling down here, 4 times 50, 200 newtons pulling up there. Notice also, though there's a mechanical advantage in this system, which is the wheelbarrow system, class 2, 
the more you move the effort by 10 centimeters, you only move the load by half that amount. So there is mechanical advantage in both a class one and in a class two seesaw. But in a seesaw, lever, or in the wheelbarrow system, the load will not move as far as the effort does. But in a class three system, which is your arm, the effort moves a small amount to be amplified in the lever at the hand. But the effort your muscle is putting in is going to be much greater than the lifting power at the hand. So that was our three types of lever. And we did resistors in parallel. We go two plus three equals answer on the calculator. But what happens if they're in parallel? If they're in parallel, we go two ohms, three ohms. If they're in parallel, the total resistance given will be less than the minimum resistance in parallel. Because 1 over resistance total will equal 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. Or on the calculator, we will go 2 x to the minus 1 button plus 3 x to the minus 1 button which can be a second function on the calculator, or it can say 1 over x, equals, and what do we have? I kept saying to the class, what is that number that you end up with? Equals, answer. But what is that answer? We have to, x to the minus 1, that figure. So it will be a half, plus a third, which will be, 0.5 plus 0.33, 0.833, and we x to the minus 1 that, 1 over 0.833. On the calculator, as soon as you press x to the minus 1 on your answer and the equals, you will get your R total. But just remember, you do have to press 2 x to the minus 1 plus 3 x to the minus 1 equals, the answer will come up, and then you press x to the minus 1 equals, and you'll get your answer for the total. Right, I hope that was useful to you. Um, so we've covered the impedance triangle, the power triangle, kVar, kVA, kilowatts, Z, impedance, R, pure resistance, X, reactance in ohms, 2 pi FL for inductance, for inductive reactance in ohms, and what we do with the farads, or the microfarads for the capacitance is 1 over 2 pi FL, of course C, the phase angle, or the phase shift angle. We've covered resistance and resistivity. Rho, that weak rho, which is resistivity, ohms, meters, ohm meters, resistivity. What else did we cover? Levers. I started with the class three lever, and I said the effort is between the fulcrum and the load. We then went on to the class one lever, where the fulcrum is between the load and the effort. And we went on to class two levers, where the load is between the fulcrum and the effort. I covered a bit of transposition of formulae, and remember that everything you do to one side, you have to do to the other side. And that the opposite of a square root is the index two. And that the opposite of squaring x is 
Pasquale. 